saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody's having a fantastic day today. Our study on the book of Galatians brings us to today's study on chapter 3. So far, chapter 1 and 2, Paul is addressing the Galatians, numerous groups of believers all throughout the Galatian region. Now, before we begin, I'd like to address a question that came in to me in the ministry. Uh, the question was, why did God keep the dispensation of grace a secret since before the foundation of the world and only reveal it to Paul? Well, first of all, Paul addresses this question in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 shortly after writing Galatians and Thessalonians. In Corinthians, Paul writes in verse 6, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that, ke that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Speaking of the body of Christ here. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, since our salvation is based on our Lord Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, He had to be crucified first. The crucifixion is the foundation to our salvation in Christ Jesus. And if the enemy would have known that God was going to save all of mankind through His manifested flesh, Jesus, by crucifixion, then the enemy would have done everything possible to stop Jesus' death in the first place, which would have kept mankind under the law, unable to attain righteousness through Christ Jesus, ultimately leading to God's wrath and eternal judgment and damnation upon all of his creation. So that's why God kept the creation of the body of Christ a secret hidden from the world until the nation of Israel would reject God three times. We know first they deny God by idolatry, worshiping other gods. That's strike one. Second, they reject their Messiah Jesus who was prophesied in scripture and they have him killed. Well, that's strike two. Third, they reject and blaspheme the Holy Spirit when they kill their prophet Stephen who the Holy Spirit was speaking through. They stone Stephen to death. That's strike three. Then God reveals his secret plan to a Pharisee named Saul, which we know as our Apostle Paul. So I hope that answers your question in part. Now on to our study. For those of you who watched the study on the book of Acts, you might recall early in that study, I said, if you want a good idea of what Paul was thinking and going through at the time early on in his ministry, then read the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is all about what Paul was dealing with right from the beginning of his ministry. Now keep in mind, when Paul was converted, there were thousands and thousands of what we know as the little flock, the kingdom saints born from our Lord's ministry. They didn't just disappear, they remained on the earth after our Lord ascended to heaven. So where does this phrase little flock come from? Well, it's found in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus is talking to the kingdom saints, the disciples here, about the end days, Daniel's 70th week. In Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, who is the earthly kingdom promised to in prophecy, where we read about the, the prophecies in, in Scripture? We know that the kingdom of heaven, the earthly kingdom, is promised by covenant to the nation of Israel. In verse 33, sell that ye have and give alms. See, we see works there. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Verse 32, Jesus calls the believers under his earthly ministry the little flock these are kingdom saints 
in the dispensation of the Mosaic law system. The problem Paul's addressing in the book of Galatians is this period of time when the dispensation of the kingdom, the little flock, and the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, were on earth simultaneously. The book of Acts, the transitional book, addresses this period of time when there was a transition from the kingdom gospel that Jesus preached to the gospel of grace that Paul preached from prophecy to mystery from Peter to Paul. Now Paul in Galatians is addressing the fact that the kingdom saints, the Jews under the Mosaic system were tricking members of the body of Christ back under bondage of laws and works, Jewish traditions. The saints in the body of Christ became saints by belief alone, believing on Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But the Jews, zealous about the laws, were bewitching or manipulating the body of Christ saints to believe that faith alone wasn't enough, that they needed to do more to stay saved or to maintain their position in Christ Jesus. Make no mistake about it, Peter's little flock, James's Jews, who were all zealous for the law, were directly opposed to Paul's gospel and the body of Christ. This would eventually lead to Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Now recall what it wasn't that it wasn't the Romans who pushed to have Paul in prison. The Romans actually wanted to set Paul free. The entire Jewish economy at the time was built by keeping people under subjection by the Jewish laws and traditions. Very much the same way a certain other mega religious system is doing today. Paul's gospel was a direct threat to the Jewish economy. So they wanted to do away with Paul and his gospel of faith alone without laws and works. This conflict between these two groups led to all kinds of fighting and confusion. It's this confusion that Paul's addressing here. He's trying to reassure the body of Christ that they don't need to perform works under the laws to be saved or to maintain their salvation. He's confirming to them that once they're added to the body of Christ, they're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In the faith of Jesus Christ, is keeping them sealed, keeping them saved. We saw how it's the faith of Jesus who keeps us in his body, and he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2, Paul addresses this in verse 11. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now keep in mind, in verse 11, it, Paul writes, It is a faithful saying. So he's quoting something here. He's quoting scripture. Verse 13, If we believe not, yet he, Jesus, abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now look at verse 13 closely and read it over and over again. If we believe not, this is after you've been saved, added into the body of Christ, okay? Our faith will waver. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Even when our faith wavers from day to day, our Lord's faith cannot waver. Remember, Paul is writing to believers here, okay? He's writing to Timothy. Once we're added to the body, his body, he keeps us there. Nothing can remove us because God himself is keeping us in his body forever. Amen. Paul addresses our security in Christ Jesus in the book of Romans. Look at Romans 8 verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Also, we discussed in our last study, 
The gospel for the kingdom saints is found in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also found in Hebrews through Revelation. Hebrews through Revelation will be instrumental scripture for those left on earth after the harpazo, the rapture takes place. Notice those books are all about faith plus works. The opposite from what Paul teaches us in his books, Romans through Philemon. And when you read those books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Hebrews through Revelation, and you should read them, you should study them. All, God, all of God's word needs to be studied, all 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, You'll notice when you study the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Hebrews through Revelation, you'll notice a very distinct difference from Paul's gospel. There's a conflict going on or even what seems to be many contradictions between those books for the little flock and Paul's books, Romans through Philemon, for us today, the body of Christ. The same problem we're having today is no different than the problem Paul was addressing in the book of Galatians. Okay, People were placing themselves under the wrong gospel, into the wrong group of people, and getting all confused. Today, we see people placing themselves into the wrong gospel all the time. They're using scripture meant for the kingdom saints in the last days, the Jews. And I shared with you uh, in the last study in Galatians chapter 2, a small clip of a video showing this exact problem that we're talking about. The small clip showed us a person who's placing himself in the book of Hebrews using scripture, little flock scripture, and he believes salvation can be lost today. His problem boils down to the lack of right division and not having knowledge of dispensations. Make no mistake about it. The book of Hebrews does say that you can lose your salvation. That's absolutely true. So his understanding of Hebrews is correct. That's because the Hebrews, the little, the little flock of Jews in the last days during Daniel's 70th week will be able to lose their justification. And the word justification is a law term based on having to do something to keep something, to maintain a particular status. The Jews will have to endure till the end to be delivered. The problem Paul's addressing in Galatians still applies today. People are placing themselves into the wrong program by not knowing how the Bible is written. It's dispensationally. And we went over that many, many, many times. Okay. Now, let's begin our study today, Galatians chapter 3. In this study, Paul is going to address five topics. And we're going to also be talking about some other very important issues as well. Paul's five topics are going to include justification by faith alone, how the law brought a curse upon mankind, how God's promise is concrete and cannot be changed, the very purpose for the laws, and our inheritance as heirs in Christ Jesus. The year again is somewhere around 48, 49 AD. This is after Paul and Barnabas's journey through Cyprus and the region of Galatia, the cities of Lystra, Derb, Iconium, Little Antioch, and many others. Now, why did Paul bring Barnabas along with him? Well, we know Barnabas was Jewish. He became a believer in the kingdom program. He's a kingdom saint. He's part of the little flock. And he was also from the island of Cyprus. Barnabas was instrumental at opening doors for Paul, introducing Paul to many of his Jewish friends, clearing the path for Paul, so to speak. Now, Galatians 3, King James Version, always in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth? crucified among you. Now we see here that Paul's tone isn't exactly a happy one. He's deeply hurt and he's deeply concerned for the Galatians. Paul calls them foolish Galatians. We'll see why they're being foolish as we continue on in our study. Let's look at the word bewitched for a moment. The word bewitched is used in two additional verses in the King James Version Bible. Once in Acts 8 verse 9, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time 
in the same city use sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Again, Acts verse 8, verse 11, And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. So in each situation, the word bewitched is connected to being tricked by deception. Now, there's a word that we use today, which is not in God's word. It's not in the King James Version Bible, which we all have heard. And again, it's not found in the Bible. And the word is manipulate or being manipulated. The word manipulate in today's definition and the same way that we use it now is very much like how they use the word bewitched 2000 years ago. Let's look at Webster's 1828 dictionary, the definition in that dictionary bewitched to fascinate, to gain an ascendancy over by charms or incantations, an operation which was formerly supposed to injure the person bewitched so that he lost his flesh or behaved in a strange, unaccountable manner. Ignorant people being inclined to ascribe to evil spirits what they could not account for. To charm, to fascinate, to please to such a degree as to take away the power of resistance. The charms of poetry our souls bewitch. To deceive and mislead by juggling tricks or imposter. So the word bewitch can be defined by being manipulated by trickery or deception. The body of Christ throughout Galatia were being manipulated into believing that in order to keep their salvation, they needed to keep the laws. They needed to continue performing works in order to stay saved. Another gospel. Obviously, we're seeing the result of the transition. Two gospels taking place at the same time, causing this confusion that Paul was dealing with. This problem or this bewitchment still continues today. We saw an example of that in the video clip I shared with you in the last study, Galatians 2. The man in the video is convinced that salvation can be lost because he puts himself in scripture that's meant for the kingdom saints. Again, right division is key. The absence of right division is the root cause of salvation insecurity. Continuing on verse 2. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Paul's pleading with them here, reminding them of how they got saved in the first place, through faith alone without the law. Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye, therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham? And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Our Lord Jesus took that curse upon himself on the cross and finished it. The curse no longer had power over the people. Only if and when they turned to Christ Jesus alone to deliver them from that curse. Verse 11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. You hear that? No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham 
might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet, if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereunto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and two seeds, as of money, many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. In the next verse, Paul tells them why the law was placed upon them. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The law was placed over Israel until the seed would come. This seed, of course, being Christ Jesus. The problem was they chose the law over Jesus. And that created a, a situation for Israel where their prophecy wasn't fulfilled to completion, halting the ushering in of the earthly kingdom. So it's not done yet. They still need to go through the prophecy of Daniel, finishing the 70th week, seven years of trials and tribulations, not only Daniel, but Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and all those prophets speak about the day of the Lord. The beginning of the day of the Lord is Daniel's 70th week, a time of trials and tribulations, okay, until they, Israel, call upon the name of the Lord to be delivered. Then they'll be redeemed and their promised covenant of the earthly kingdom will come to fruition. Go ahead and read Joel 2 verses 28 to 32 for more clarification on that. Now, Galatians 3 verse 20. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now we need to examine verse 22. If you didn't catch it, there's something we need to discuss here. Another one of those Paul's little hidden gems that reveals a whole lot about our security in Christ Jesus. And of course, Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit wrote everything in God's Word, even through the Apostle Paul. Now remember in our last study, we saw two verses that were also changed in the counterfeit versions of the Bible. We saw how the, they changed the faith of Jesus Christ, keeping us sealed in His body, to faith in Jesus Christ, making it our responsibility to maintain our salvation. And here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 22, the enemy has done it again, changing Jesus' faith to our faith, from salvation without works to salvation plus works. Let's compare the King James Version to some counterfeit versions regarding this verse and reveal the enemy's tactics. The King James Version, verse 22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Here in the King James Version, it makes perfect sense. It's Jesus' faith of his promise to us, and all we have to do is believe it, receive it. Now, let's compare that. Let's look at the counterfeit changes, uh, the counterfeit versions and the changes, uh, all these changes that change the meaning, okay? in the NIV but the scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe 
in the New King James Version, but the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In the ESV, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In the ASV, but the scripture shut up all things under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. In the NLT, New Living Translation, but the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Wow, isn't it interesting that Galatians, a book that tells us all about our liberty in Christ Jesus, that clearly tells us that we're no longer under the law, not subjected to works or bondage. We have salvation by faith alone, kept secure by the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. This one book that says all of that happens to be the one book the enemy has hit hard with changes, trying to change the meaning of several verses to a works-based salvation. Just like Paul was a direct threat to the religious economy 2,000 years ago, Paul's gospel is still a direct threat to, to, to today's religious economy, hence all the corrupted versions being used by these denominational systems even today. Make no mistake about this, a works-based system always leads to money and hell, of course, and they do that by placing themselves between you and God. They make themselves the mediator instead of our Lord Jesus being our mediator. You see, Jesus doesn't want or require money, but the religious program demands and relies on money to sustain their system. If you follow the money, it'll take you down a very dark and revealing road. I guess if you want to know the truth, all you have to do is look at what's been changed in God's word by the enemy what he's trying to hide. There's a reason why he's hiding these things from people. And the reason is God's true word reveals the truth. Salvation is by faith alone, without works, without religion, without money, without man, without denominations, without economy, without blah, blah, blah. Remember Paul's very serious warning that he wrote in Galatians 1 verse 8. And nine, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Verse nine, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. The gospel we saw in that video clip in the last study is another gospel. It's not for us today in the dispensation of grace. And I'm giving those people a very serious wake up call. Wake up. Get out of Israel's gospel and get into Paul's gospel before it's too late. The clock is ticking closer and closer to Daniel's 70th week. Understand. That when you're using a new version of the Bible, you're not reading God's word. You're reading man's interpretation of what God's word says. You're reading man's word. The King James Version Bible is God's word, period. Now, why are all the new versions so different than the King James Version Bible? There are several reasons, but we're going to take a look at at least two of those. First, the reason why they change God's word is to promote a works-based salvation. To promote a works-based religious denominational system. The religious economy that we discussed. It would be kind of hard for them to continue selling people a works-based system while several books in God's word directly expose and conflict with their teachings. Their religious lies would fall apart as soon 
as their people would read the truth in God's word. So they have to hide the truth from the people by changing God's word, you see? And in some cases, people are told not to even read God's word. They're told that God's word must be interpreted by a priest of some sort. That's very dangerous. And in the past, God's word was off limits. Anyone caught with a Bible was put to death. And when that didn't work out too well, they changed God's word to Latin. So no one could understand God's word, but the priest, which they were sent to schools to learn that language of Latin. And when then that, when that didn't work out too good, they just changed God's word. And that's where we're at today. Which brings us to the second reason we have corrupted versions floating around the globe. The changes they make to God's word starts with the original text. Going back many, many centuries. Leading us to two distinct Greek texts. The first Greek text is the Syrian coming from Antioch. This text was scripture written directly by the apostles and disciples at the time. Our King James Version Bible comes from this Syrian Antioch text. The other source comes from Alexandria. These scriptures are from writings stemming from outside of the apostles' writings. In other words, the Alexandria text is a writing of a writing of a writing of a writing of what they think the apostles said. Kind of like what we call today hearsay. To get into the details on all that is a study on it so, uh, by itself. It would take several hours to do it right. So, for the reasons of trying to keep this study at a reasonable length, what I'm going to do is provide to you a link that you can go to that goes into the specifics of everything that I just mentioned, specifically concerning these two sources, why there's such corruption concerning the Alexandrian text, which is where the Vatican took all of its scripture from which leads directly to the counterfeit versions. In other words, once you investigate this, you'll see that the new versions today come directly from the Vaticana, the Roman Catholic authority. You'll see all of this on the link on the screen. It's good information and you, you, know, you should all really take the time to look into it so you have education on this. Just more reason to use and stick to the King James Version Bible. Now, concerning our faith versus our Lord's faith, our faith, as we know, will waver from time to time. But our Lord's faith does not waver. Once we're added to his body, he keeps us there. Nothing can remove us because God himself is keeping us sealed in his body forever. Amen? We're sealed by his faith and his promise by the Spirit of promise, the Holy Spirit, that we're sealed with at the time of being added to his body. That's why Paul writes that the Holy Spirit is our earnest. The word earnest means promise or down payment. It's not something that we can lose because it's God's faith, the faith of Jesus Christ that keeps it there, keeps us in that body. It's his promise to us. Look at 2 Corinthians verse 1. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, or yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us, us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts ephesians 1 12 that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in christ in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. There is no works involved in the body of Christ. There is no keeping yourself saved. All of that is impossible. 
If it were possible for us to work our way into salvation or keep it, then Jesus died and rose for nothing in vain. Moving on, Galatians 3.23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3 verse 27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And in verse 27, Paul mentions the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We're baptized into the body of Christ. The word baptized means to be placed into something. There are many different types of baptism in, in God's word. So we're baptized, the, the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace, we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into his body, into the body of Christ. And nothing can take us out of his body. We're permanently sealed. Verse 29, Paul says we're heirs, not servants. You see, servants have a master. They continue, they, they continue to work for the master. Their job is to work and serve their master. So we're not servants. We're heirs. We're sons of God. Okay? It's a different position. A son and a father relationship, the son doesn't have to work to keep being his son. He doesn't have to prove anything to be his son. He is automatically his son. He's an heir of the father. And so are we. So we're sons of God. We're added into a position of inheritance given to us by belief, by faith, and is promised and sealed by the faith of Christ Jesus. So we've gone over a lot in this study and there's a lot to that to digest so i think i'm going to stop here for now unto christ jesus be uh, unto christ jesus be all the glory and praise lord willing i'll see you uh saints in the next study in galatians chapter 4.